Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Richard Safe Workplace Lecture Series. Uh, once again, uh, we have with us an amazing speaker today. Uh, this is Dr. Gwen Fisher from Colorado State University. She uh, support, she is the director of the Occupational Health Psychology Program there uh, and is also the uh, past president of the Society for Occupational Health Psychologists, right? And those who have taken or will take or have thought about taking the Occupational Health Psychology intro course that I teach, uh, she's one of the editors of one of the textbooks that we yes. um, we read in there. So she her, her knowledge is vast. Uh, her research experience and, and such is also a, a amazing and wonderful. And she's going to tell you a little bit more about the, the specific topics of how she got into what she's doing now. And so I'll turn the time over to Dr. Fisher to uh, address us, and we'll have time for questions at the end of the, of the, of the lecture. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the incredible introduction, Dr. Allen. Thank you all so much for having me here today and for taking time out of your schedule on a Friday to join um, given that amazing introduction, I um, I hope I don't disappoint you. Um, I feel like that that set a, a pretty high bar for for what I may be talking about today. So I'll I'll do my best um, here. So just I want to begin by just sharing a little bit about my background, recognizing the interdisciplinary. Uh, or multidisciplinary nature of this audience and and all of you. And so I'll begin by just sharing a little bit about my background in terms of what I've done and how I've gotten to where I am. It, to, it was a very non-traditional path in academia to say the least. And then I'll move on to the content of my talk today, which is talking about well-being and job characteristics and the nature of the work that we do and how it's related to well-being. So in order to accomplish that, I will define what we mean by well-being then I'll talk a little bit about work design and job characteristics and what that looks like. And um, I'm probably not gonna go too deep into the theoretical background, but I will share some empirical findings from a few studies that my colleagues and I have conducted. And then perhaps what I think of as most importantly, spend some time sharing my thoughts about the implications. What do the results of this research mean for not just research, but for practice, so that we can hopefully have a measurable impact on improving the health and well being of people in the workforce, share a few ideas about future research, and do my best to monitor the clock so that we have plenty of time for any questions that you may have and, and hopefully some discussion about these issues as well. If you have questions as I'm going, please don't hesitate to be shy and speak up. And I'm, I know I'm looking at the folks who are physically here in the room. And, and I appreciate many of you who are also joining via Zoom. Um, my uh, skills in navigating the chat while giving a talk both in person and remotely, um, those, those skills have deteriorated since we've been back in person. Um, so I'll just say that for anyone who is on Zoom, if you have a question, um, although you're welcome to put it in the chat, please don't be shy and you're welcome to also unmute and just speak up simply so that I don't miss it because I may not even be looking at the chat or monitoring that as we, as we go. Um, perfect. So feel free to interrupt me. Um, I have, uh, I'm a mom with two teenage boys. Uh, I'm used to being interrupted. Um, and I'm sure that all of you will be more respectful than they can be at times. Um, whoops, going the wrong way there. Okay, so just uh, a little bit by way of background. Um, uh, very briefly, I'm originally from the East Coast, from New Jersey, and then went to college at Penn State University. New Jersey was a beautiful place to grow up, uh, but it was also where I didn't want to go to college with everyone I went to high school with. And so I went to Penn State, and then I worked really hard to lose my accent. But if you get me saying certain words at certain times, there will be pieces that might come in there. And it was in, as a sophomore in college, I, I was find it. I've joined the Zoom for I it. gave up my... Um, wait, just check. Okay, no problem. Um, I gave up my dream of becoming a medical doctor somewhere around uh, sophomore year of high school, but I knew I wanted to help people. 
And then I was a psychology major and I quickly learned that I didn't want to be a clinician. Um, I thought I would burn out by doing that. And so then I went to the career center and said, what else can I do as a psychology major? And I learned about this incredible field called industrial organizational psychology, psychology applied to work settings. And as somebody who worked through high school and was working two 20 hour a week part-time jobs to support myself in college, uh, all of it just resonated with me. And, um, and I just really got excited about the field and how I got into occupational health was more as a graduate student at Bowling Green. Um, and a little piece of trivia, Joe and I share the same, uh, advisor, his, um, advisor in graduate school was also mine, uh, in my early days at Bowling Green. So it's, it's a little bit of a small world. And I knew that I wanted to do research. And so when I graduated, um, it's a long story how I ended up at Michigan. Um, there's somewhere about a bad relationship choice where I ended up there, but um, it turned out to be a, a fortuitous thing. And I worked at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan, which is a large interdisciplinary social science research institute. And I worked in an organization within there called the Survey Research Center on a large study of health and retirement. And you'll hear a little bit more about that um, because I'll be sharing data from that project. But I was fortunate to be there for 12 years, but really um, my passion for occupational health, my passion for organizational and applied psychology won out. And I also really wanted to work with and mentor students. And I also love to ski and I love the West. So the opportunity to go to Colorado State has been fantastic. I've been on the faculty there for 11 years. Um, so the key thing here is I'm trained in psychology. So what I'll be sharing with you today is really from that um, perspective while taking into account kind of a, a broader social psychological context for the work that I do. Broadly speaking, my research program studies three general topics, aging workforce and retirement issues, not what I went to graduate school for, but what I did get to identify as important when I'm working with a large team of economists at the Institute for Social Research and recognizing how the work that we do and what we do in organizational psychology, what does that mean for aging and retirement? Um, I've also always had a passion for work, non-work issues. I strongly believe there just are not enough hours in the day to do everything we both want and need to do. So I still dabble in that research, uh, particularly with my graduate students who are pretty passionate about a work-life balance. And then I've always um, enjoyed research methods. And it goes back to my graduate training with Dr. Rogelberg, um, who uh, has done a lot of work on, on surveys and survey research. So I, I love to nerd out on, on survey methods and statistics. So broadly speaking, what I'm here to talk with you about today is how is the nature of what we do, the characteristics of our job and our work, how does that relate to our well-being? So in a physical science, um, industrial hygiene capacity, you know, there may be um, physical aspects of the work environment that can shape people's work uh, or shape their health. Um, you know, when we think about occupational medicine and occupational illnesses and injuries, whether it's an event or a long-term exposure of some sort. And so what I'm really thinking about here are what are the psychosocial exposures, the nature of the tasks that we do and the way our work is designed, and what does that mean for our health and well-being? And then furthermore, because I was trained in psychology and I love measurement, um, what are, I've also done some work on what are the best ways to assess these characteristics of jobs so that we can better understand the work people are doing. So does that make sense? Okay. So what is worker well-being? Um, many of you could probably explain more about this to me than the other way around. But to put in perspective, the model that I'm using for thinking about worker well-being is a multidimensional model. This goes back to work by Ramya Chari, Cha Cha Chang, Steve Sauter, and a team through both NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, as well as the RAND Corporation to broadly define worker well-being as a combination of health status, which comprises physical and mental health as well as the nature of the work environment, how workers evaluate 
their experience, what are they actually experiencing, and then their perceptions. In psychology, we have, uh, I think, a strong belief that perception is reality. And so two of you may be doing identical jobs with identical job descriptions, but experience that very differently. And we want to provide validity for and recognize each of those unique perspectives. So the work evaluation and experience. There's also the physical work environment, as well as the safety climate in which that work is done and recognizing that those things um, are part of worker well-being and can also affect worker well-being. Also the policies and culture of the workplace. I think back to an example in Colorado of a company where during COVID early on, before we knew what was going on, there were workers showing up every day, working in close proximity to one another and showing up to work even while they were ill or having symptoms. And they were still showing up to work because they were afraid of losing their jobs if they didn't show up to work. And also the nature of their job was that if they didn't show up to work, they didn't get paid. So there was a strong um, financial and employment incentive to come to work, whether you're sick or not. And not surprisingly, many people got sick and very sadly, some of those workers died. Um, we have a, um, one of the staff members in our department lost both of her parents, um, during that time, um, simply because of something that many of us know could have been preventable by a better policy toward having paid work, uh, you know, offering sick pay, um, and letting people take time off and, and, making sure that people's jobs are protected. So there's a lot about the policies and the culture. And then understanding that this all happens in the context of our work out, our life outside of work, the community and the society in which we live. So why does worker well-being matter? Again, I'm likely um, preaching to the choir, so to speak, but the nature of what we do and our experience at work can affect both our mental and our physical health. We've seen an epidemic of burnout that has happened um, to people doing too much work or experiencing strain from a variety of sources, uh, different stressors in the workplace that can affect our mental health as well as our physical health. And our mind and bodies are connected. So um, all of these things together are important. Additionally, our experiences at work can translate to our family. If we have a great day, we might go home and be in a great mood. On the flip side, um, if you think back to maybe the last time something stressful happened or you experienced incivility or, or had something negative happen at work and you go home and talk to a significant other or other people about it, or it might just simply be that you went home and you just weren't in a great mood, or maybe you just didn't have the same kind of energy that you would otherwise. So, so our work affects our family. And then likewise, we know that what's happening outside of work and issues with our family can also affect us at work as well. Um, just because we walk through that door doesn't mean those issues and concerns go away. Um, as an industrial organizational psychologist, a lot of what I've studied and what I do focuses on how does this affect work? Um, in my previous uh, slide on this, I, I had, you know, bullet points about family and then like a whole slide on work outcomes. Um, but I'll summarize it and just say that our well-being can affect how we feel about our jobs, whether we're satisfied, whether um, we are committed to our organizations, our likelihood of staying or wanting to stay there. It can affect our behavior. How many of you are familiar with the concept of presenteeism? Okay, so uh, glad to hear that um, here. And, and so that's just an example of, um, you know, we may go to work and not be at our best or go to work sick. Um, and so uh, our well-being can affect our behavior in that form. It can certainly affect absenteeism and it can affect turnover as well as when and how we retire or leave the workplace and, and all of those things affect productivity and so forth. Um, and this is just an error on the slide. The health services and healthcare utilization bullet should be further to the left. Um, but our well being affects what services we may use um, and, and affect things at a more societal level. And of course, um, it looks different in the United States with our um, privatized healthcare system compared to many other places in the world. And then of course, all of these things affect society. And I think we all saw that firsthand with COVID in terms of what people experienced during that time and since then. 
So the big idea that I want to share with you today is really about how the nature of the work we do and the way work is designed can affect our well-being. Again, worker well-being broadly defined as I did just before. And so for those of you not familiar with the psychological aspects of this, generally speaking, what we aim to do is hope for work that is structured and designed in a way that is motivating where you go to work and, and you're excited and motivated to do what you need to do. Um, sometimes you're motivated simply because if you don't do it, you're going to lose your job. But in the best days, there's intrinsic motivation where you find it meaningful, you enjoy it, you're satisfied. Um, and it's not just because of an extrinsic factor related to pay or employment. Um, so when it's, it's, when it's psychologically well-designed, it can really, um, instill intrinsic motivation. It can improve our job performance. It can actually improve our mental and physical health. Um, and in turn, our well-being, taking all of those other dimensions into account. And so within organizational psychology, there have been various ways of conceptualizing job characteristics and how work is designed. One of the most well-known models is the job characteristics model, which goes way back to the 1970s, where they defined job characteristics based on five things. One is having autonomy, having some say over what you do and how you do your work. Um, anyone here who really enjoys, has, is there anyone here who has been micromanaged at some point in your career? Okay, oh, well, keep your hands up. Um, is there anyone here, uh, would you also keep your hand up if I say that that was not a pleasant experience? Okay, um, thank you. I, I ask that question a lot when I talk about autonomy and when I teach it in my classes, and I have yet to find someone that has said that they enjoy being micromanaged. There's a difference between having someone initiate structure and provide guidance and structure, particularly if it's ambiguous or if it's a new task or where we lack familiarity versus being told so much what to do, how to do it, where we, we just feel constrained. So according to the job characteristics model, workers are gonna be more motivated when they have some autonomy and some say over what they're doing and how they're doing it, which I see as being kind of the opposite of being micromanaged. Um, many workers also enjoy being able to use a variety of skills, not just one thing. Um, I'm certainly appreciative of Bubba's great technical skills, um, but hopefully in your work, you get to do more than just make sure all the tech stuff is working um, and, and so forth. Uh, task identity is how much meaning and identification we get by doing certain tasks. Um, one of the things I get to do as a professor is mentor graduate students, and, and I just find a lot of joy and satisfaction by doing that, um, and I identify a bit with that. Um, and it relates somewhat to task significance and, and how significant and impactful and meaningful that is. Um, it, it gets tricky to kind of differentiate these things, but I think you get my gist. And then a lot of people enjoy getting feedback about how they're doing. Sometimes doing work, but not knowing how well you're doing or is it effective can be challenging. And so um, healthy work and, and it's motivating when you can get feedback about how you're doing, um, particularly if you get positive feedback, but if it's constructive so you can channel your effort and energy in important ways, that can be useful too. And then there are other ways we can think about jobs in terms of, say, for example, the cognitive complexity of what we do. And my guess is that all of you are engaged in what would probably be categorized as cognitively complex work, where you have to do a lot of thinking, reasoning, problem solving, um, and be very mindful and, and put your brain into what you're doing at work. And it's less about um, going through physical tasks that don't involve a lot of information processing. Is that, would you agree that your work involves a lot of thinking and, and all of that, um, which can be awesome. Um, it can also be mentally exhausting. Uh, so yeah, so the cut, so, um, some of the data I'll show, share with you today relates to the cognitive complexity of our work. 
Um, other ways we can characterize jobs is on a continuum of the extent to which they involve stressors, where there are exposures to various sources of job stress, and it could lead to a process that can result in negative outcomes stemming from job stress. And then another one is work that is physically demanding. Um, so I know some of you may be involved in work with firefighters. That's an example of a pretty physically demanding job to the point that there are even physical ability tests often used in selecting firefighters for jobs, having to carry people, carry heavy hoses. Has anyone here even ever held a fire hose and tried spraying water when it's at full? What was that like? Yes, it's heavy, right? And there's a lot of force behind that water. They usually don't put the person on the hose because of the power that they want to put behind it to get as much wet stuff on the red stuff that they can. So Exactly. Thank you so much for sharing that. And there are lots of other physically demanding jobs. I have a son who aspires to be an athlete um, and uh, that's one type of physically demanding work. People who, um, plumbers are doing a lot of stooping, kneeling, crouching, and, and just crawling around in, in places. We can probably think of a lot of, um, different jobs, uh, people that deliver mail on foot, um, just many, many different types of work that can be physically demanding in multiple ways. So the next concept I want to talk about is workability. Is there anyone here that's heard this term before? Okay, a few of you. So the history of research on workability goes back to work that was done in Finland by the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health and specifically by a researcher by the name of Ilmarinen, who identified a worker's job-related functional capacity as being important for being able to remain in the labor force. And Elmarinen's work found that health was a huge predictor of workability. And so when I say job-related functional capacity, I'm not talking about job performance in terms of how good you are at your job, but rather whether you're able to accomplish or meet the demands of what is expected of you um, and your perception that you can meet those job demands. And we are interested in workability in an occupational health context because ultimately our goal is to help people be able to stay at work. Or if in the case of a work, uh, in the case of any kind of injury or illness, if somebody's out of work or on disability, it's trying to get them back to work. And certainly what many of you and particularly anyone in occupational medicine or occupational health nursing may know about just the whole process of return to work. And so when we can maintain workers' job-related functional capacity, it can be good for the organization. It could be good for society, keeping people employed. And in our um, current system regarding uh, the finances of retirement, especially with defined contribution pension plans and not being able to rely on Social Security as the sole means for retirement, having people continue to work um, and be able to afford what they want and need can be helpful for a lot of reasons. And so, um, so I would argue that workability is an important construct and one that we should care about in occupational health. And so in this first study I'll describe, we looked at how the nature of workers' job characteristics and also some of their personal characteristics were related to their perceptions of workability and then in turn, how those worker perceptions of their job-related functional capacity was related to other more distal outcomes in terms of disability and retirement. And so I don't expect that you could read the small font over on the left side, um, but I'll just summarize and say that the top box describes job demands, what it, what are, what's expected of you, and, and many of those are job-related stressors, like having too much work to do, role overload, having time pressure, experiencing interpersonal conflict at work, um, working in what we call broadly negative environment conditions, which can include both physical conditions, um, extreme temperatures, being engaged in really physically demanding work or doing work where you have to be in an unfavorable body position for extended periods of time, which of course can relate to ergonomic issues and problems. And again, when I think about this, I think of that 
plumber who is crouched down, crawling under a sink and trying to wedge themselves in somewhere. Um, we can also think about surgeons who um, stand for inordinate amounts of time. It could be, you know, a very, very long time or, or even, um, you know, people who cut our hair or work at, at the grocery store where they're not allowed to sit. Um, we can look at job resources, the second box, things like autonomy, having support from coworkers and supervisors, also having personal resources. So our physical and mental health can serve as a resource that allows us to do our job. Um, as an aside, I remember years ago meeting with a financial planner and they asked what the most valuable asset was that I had. And I thought, oh, gosh, I'm talking to a finance person. I, I don't know what the right answer is. Um, I'll turn it over to you. What do any of you think one of the biggest assets may be that you have? What's going to help you earn money to sustain yourself for the rest of your life or support your family? Time. Health. Health. Exactly. <laughs> if, if we don't have our health, it makes it really hard to work. Um, thank you. So that's exactly right. And so here we operationalize or conceptualize health status and having good health as, as a personal resource that we bring to being able to do our work. Um, and then we can also further look at saying, you know, a lack of, um, so here health status is, you know, overall, how would you rate your health? Very good, excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. Um, separately, we can look at the number of chronic illnesses somebody may have and say that somebody that has multiple chronic illnesses um, may be less healthy than somebody with only a couple. Now, granted, that's an oversimplification. It doesn't take into account severity. It doesn't take into account functioning capacity regarding those illnesses, um, but it's, it's at least a, a start. Um, and then we can look at some psychosocial things like our sense of control over our life and our, our work in general. We can look at positive mood, um, conscientiousness as a personality characteristic, people who are detail-oriented, follow through, um, and so forth. Um, one, we know from our psychology world that those are people that often perform better at their jobs regardless of the type of job. We've also seen research that people who are conscientious are more likely to go to the doctor. And people who are more likely to go to the doctor are more likely to get preventive healthcare. And to the extent that we believe in preventive medicine and trying to prevent health issues before they become problems, you know, primary prevention instead of tertiary prevention can be helpful. So again, we look at these characteristics as, as personal resources. Um, and finally, emotional stability, the extent to which we can just maintain um, stability there being beneficial. And then we also, in this research, looked at interactions between the work factors, the job demands, um, and the resources, and also the personal factors to see to what extent do those predict workers' perceptions of their job-related functional capacity. So any questions about the model or the components? you look at these define conscientiousness sure that's a great question so oftentimes conscientiousness and other personality characteristics although that being the only one here is through a self-report survey measure and asking people using a liquor type rating scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree the extent to which they would describe themselves as being detail oriented um, completing tasks in a timely manner, meeting deadlines, being organized, things like that. Is that? Yeah, no, I think, and that's, I guess that's what I was struggling with. I mean, there's no objective measure necessarily that you can look at. No, there, I mean, there's some research where, um, say, like in a work environment, you could ask a supervisor or a coworker to provide those ratings, but it assumes they have the opportunity to observe those behaviors. Um, but in this case, it's self-report, and there's a concern of people, are people inflating um, the extent to which they um, exhibit these behaviors and traits, but we actually see variability, so not everybody is saying strongly agree to all of those things. Um, there are people, uh, you know, my, my partner in particular, 
um, would admit that he's um, he, he describes himself as the most disorganized, organized person he knows. Um, you know, all of his tools are in one place, but they're scattered in a in a corner of the garage. They're not like neatly hung up and, and placed. And so so there are people with some self-awareness to recognize, um, you know, they may not be conscientious or, or get things done, you know, or all of those things. Other questions? Okay. So for this research, we use data from the health and retirement study. Is there anyone here that's familiar with or heard of the health and retirement study or HRS? Okay, so this is the intersection of where my work at the Institute for Social Research at Michigan kind of combines. Um, I worked as a staff member and then research scientist on this project for 12 years. And it's a large ongoing longitudinal biennial study looking at a variety of different demographic, health, and economic factors related to aging and retirement. It is the largest social and behavioral sciences study funded by the National Institute on Aging on the magnitude. When I was there, it was on the magnitude of about $78 million every six years. And I can only imagine in, in direct costs. And I can only imagine that that's gone up over time. Um, they study about 18 to 20,000 people per wave of the survey every two years. And there's a lot of the data collection that happens in person, gathering biomarkers and uh, genetics and all kinds of things. Um, but it's been ongoing for more than 30 years now. The data are free and publicly available uh, from the University of Michigan. And it's a great data set for being able to look at things, particularly in um, a nationally representative sample of people in the US ages 51 and older. And the data set is designed to provide a resource for research as well as public policy. So broadly speaking, the HRS has a lot of different measures. Um, the survey interviews take about three hours to administer, not including the biomarkers and some of the other stuff they collect, but there's a lot in there. And so in this study, we looked at a few, uh, we took a subset of the data gathered across either two or three different waves of the study that were gathered up to four years apart. So in basically testing this model, we have data on the left from one point in time, and then we look later at how that's related to their perceptions of workability. And then we look at work-related absence, disability leave, and retirement a couple years down the road. And whoops, I keep going the wrong way. Sorry about that. Um, our measures of workability, it's a self-report rating. Um, basically, when you think about your lifetime best, how would you rate your current ability to work? Um, you're unable to work to it's your workability at its best. And typically, bless you, typically we see on average means around eight out of 10 on the scale, but it, um, people lower than that, it, it quickly has show, been shown to be a good predictor of disability and retirement and people not able to continue. And besides overall work, we also look at physical demands, mental demands, and interpersonal demands. And again, I'm sorry for the small font. It's hard to get everything um, in one uh, spot. Those of you that are online looking at this might have an easier time. But in short, um, we ran what's called a relative weights analysis. It's similar to a uh, multiple regression analysis, but a relative weights analysis can account for and adjust for the fact that there's multicollinearity. Um, in other words, correlated predictors on the left-hand side and the fact that um, people in better health might also be conscientious, um, may also experience more social support and so forth. But in essence, we were able to, across uh, three different unique, the health and retirement study and then a couple of other single organizational samples test this model and then look at workability and then how that relates to disability leave um, when people retire uh, and so forth. And to just summarize what you were not able to actually see, hopefully you'll take my word for it, but I'm happy to share the slides or the, the publication from which um, the study was derived. Uh, and what we found is that both personal and job resources do predict workability, specifically overall health status, having a sense of control and also reporting um, a sense of autonomy at work were among the strongest predictors of people who said that they 
um, overall can meet the demands of their job. Um, and that also in turn, that workability was a statistically significant and fairly strong predictor of disability leave, absenteeism, as well as retirement. In other words, people who were struggling with their workability were more likely to leave the workforce sooner compared to people who were still going. Um, any questions on that before I move on? Talk about like um, a lot of the disutilities of work in a compensatory way. Um, have you looked into it all, like the uh, effect of perceived workability to those outcomes as being modified by like the compensation that's offered? Um, that is a great question. I haven't looked at that. There's been certainly, as you point out, some work in economics that has looked at, relatively speaking, what are the factors that are likely to keep people at work versus likely to lead them to retire. Um, in its most simplest form, perhaps not surprisingly, it's complicated. You know, of course, there are individual differences, but um, oftentimes, so what we, I will say is that after we did this study um, with this, we followed up with another study that looked at a concept called job lock, which is a concept of people who feel stuck at work. In other words, people who would like to retire or would like to leave their job, but they simply feel that they can't because they can't afford to. And that might be afford because of wages that um, people, I mean, I'll be honest, um, are there any hockey players here or former hockey players? No. Okay, all right. Um, so my, my high school age son plays um, a very high level of competitive hockey, but in Colorado, there aren't many of those teams. So he's traveling out of state twice a month for seven months to go play. Um, you can kind of quickly do the math. It's not cheap. And by the way, if you know anything about ice hockey, he's also a goalie, which means that all that equipment he wears costs about $6,000. And he's also a growing teenager, which means those $3,000 leg pads have to be replaced every couple of years. Um, so would I like to retire eventually? Yes. But as long as I'm supporting this, um, it, it's not, and, and, you know, uh, it's like, okay, do I put money in the 529 college account or do I pay for this? Um, with, of course, no guarantee that it's going to lead to anything. So um, so there and and I'm very privileged with a, a fantastic job and and appreciate the the generous salary from Colorado State. Um, so there are people that are literally working to make ends meet. And whether it's their health or their well-being or just maybe they're just tired of work, they want to leave, but they just can't afford to for whatever reason that may be. And then add, even now that we have universal health care, um, well, I guess, you know, without debating public policy and, and where we are on, on any given day with that, um, what we do know from research is that many people are continuing to work not because of wages, but for health insurance, particularly if they are too young to qualify for Medicare or would like the, the perhaps better coverage or benefits that you can get through privatized health care. And so there, there are clearly economic incentives for continuing to work despite poor workability. And so we call when people feel stuck in those situations, we call that job lock. And my colleagues and I have done some additional research, you know, looking at what are the factors that predict people that are more likely to end up in those job lock situations um, beyond the obvious, you know, low levels of household net worth um, being one of them. But there are many you know, high net worth families where people still feel stuck. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but okay. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to share briefly one other example of ways in which the characteristics of our work relate to well-being. And here I'm going to talk about cognitive functioning, which in short is our ability to think, reason, and remember. Um, everything from you park in the parking garage and you're trying to remember where is my car parked and on what floor, because we can get 
Um, I, I Maybe this hasn't happened to any of you, but I will be the first to raise my hand and say that I've had days where I'm just not mindful of exactly where I parked. And in fact, when I left the garage at Denver airport last night, the first thing I did in my phone was type in what door I went in and in what row and on what level my car's parked so I, I can find my car when I get back. Um, and without the ability to think, reason, and remember, it's it's hard to do a lot of things in our life. And so the question here is how is, if we think about cognitive functioning as an aspect of our health and well-being, how does work relate, uh, work design relate to that? Um, so if you just take my word for the fact that we should study cognition because it's an important part of health and well-being, and if any of you have unfortunately seen or experienced family members that have experienced dementia or other health conditions in which cognitive abilities have deteriorated, um, then you may know firsthand how um, troubling this is, and on a public policy level, it's very expensive. So we looked in this work at how work is related to cognitive functioning, um, and then whether we can design work to either maintain or improve cognition across the lifespan. So if any of you enjoy doing puzzles and games or may have parents or significant others, you know, older who do their, their daily stuff to keep their mind active, the question is, what are we doing at work um, that might be cognitively demanding that cognitive complexity piece? And does that help? So when we think about how many of you took an SAT or GRE um, at some point in applying to, to whether it was college or graduate school, okay. So many of you did, um, you know, there's the verbal component and the math component. And when we think about IQ or, or just traditional intelligence measures, and then we look over the lifespan from younger ages on over, average, just typical intelligence scores, you know, as we're in school and acquiring knowledge and abilities, we're, we're on the rapid increase. And then those mainly, um, you know, we see data that show that just the middle line, traditional intelligence test scores just remain stable. But when we break cognitive functioning down into different types of cognitive abilities, we see different patterns over the lifespan. So our ability to remember and to think and process novel information sadly does decline on average over time, more so if we experience something like a stroke, uh, a heart attack, or um, people with diabetes or other health conditions that could lead to a more rapid deterioration of our thinking and reasoning abilities. Um, sadly to say, I'm, I'm somewhere on that downhill slope uh, past the early part. Yet the good news is that our, what we call crystallized intelligence, our knowledge um, is actually something that in theory we can not only retain over our lifespan, but it might actually increase. So as you gain experience and gain knowledge, those can continue. And so traditional intelligence tests that don't really discriminate between those different types of knowledge versus reasoning and memory, um, we, we see different patterns. And so the question is for that, um, solid line where you see more of the, the slope going down. Is there anything we can do to preserve those abilities as long as possible? If not, maybe reverse the trend and improve them by the nature of the work that we do. And so we used, again, data from the health and retirement study to look at this. And we tested the hypothesis of whether people who were engaged in jobs that and by this, I mean people who have been doing the same type of work for at least 10 years, not just, you know, like brand new to the job or, or doing it for a short time, but over a long period of time, are people engaged in work that are characterized as being more complex, likely to have better cognitive scores and likely to experience slower decline and comparing that to people who are in jobs that are, are less cognitively complex. And for this, we analyzed data from a little over 4,000 people. Um, we've published this work in the Journal of Occupational Health Psychology. So um, in, in, in the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of skip over the detailed methods, but for anyone interested, happy to share the full paper. Um, and our uh, measure of job complexity was based on an average across 10 different um, types of work activities from analyzing data or information to the extent to which people think creatively and process information. And a lot of noise here. 
Um, but over the 4,000 people that we analyzed, we did see a strong main effect. Um, so over time, so we have on the x-axis on the bottom, the time to and from retirement with zero in the middle. And if you're able to see in that solid line, there's a little bit of a break in the middle. So we did um, a latent growth curve analysis with a pivot point. So we looked at the time prior to retirement and the time after retirement to look at this. And um, so leading up to retirement, the solid line are the people uh, with one standard deviation above in more cognitively complex jobs, scoring better on a memory task compared to people in lower um, complexity jobs. So we see a strong main effect for people in more complex jobs having a better memory compared to those who don't after we account and control for the other things related to memory like education, um, socioeconomic status, and other uh, demographic factors that we know from other research are related. Um, and then perhaps maybe more important is what happens after people retire. And we see the same kind of main effect with people in more cognitively complex jobs continuing to demonstrate a stronger um, performance on memory compared to those in less cognitively complex jobs. So it suggests that being engaged in work that is cognitively complex is helpful for our cognitive functioning both before and after retirement, even when we control for all of the other factors that may be related. Um, so it suggests that designing work in a way that is cognitively complex and giving people autonomy and opportunities to use their brains at work um, and not micromanaging them and, and you know distilling it down that people don't have to think. We, we wanna help people design their jobs. Um, so recently, uh, and by recently, I mean like within the last three years, I worked with Sharon Parker at Curtin University and one of her postdocs at the time, MK Ward, where we did some conceptual work to better disentangle what is it about work design that we think might relate to short-term, medium-term, and longer-term cognitive outcomes. Um, once again, I'm, I'm happy to share the full paper with you that describes that, but um, we think that it's the process of, it, based on kind of a use it or lose it hypothesis, much like a muscle in our body may atrophy or shrink if we don't use it, um, we think of our brain as being the same way. So if we're using our brain in a work context to do these things, hoping that that will help preserve literally at the neuronal level, um, some of our cognitive functioning and that then that over the long term can pre hopefully prevent cognitive decline. Um, and it might even lead to changes in brain function and structure. We um, see from uh, neurology and neuroscience that there's evidence of neuroplasticity. In other words, even among adults, our brains can grow and change. And so if we can stimulate that through cognitive complexity at work and other um, beneficial cognitive activities that we might be able to improve things over time. The challenge is that um, it's not really ethical to randomly assign people to jobs and follow them from, you know, when they enter the workforce until the end to see, you know, how can we manipulate jobs to help people? There, there's likely a selection effect of who's doing what type of work. Um, but it, we, we're hoping that we can um, do some more work in this area. And I have a colleague, uh, Aga Brzezinska at Colorado State University, who's been doing some really interesting neuroscience work with imaging and looking at, at some of the, the brain images of people doing different types of work and different types of tasks. And then with longitudinal research, seeing you know whether and how um, the brain and, and functions within the brain may change over time. Um, so, so that's the gist of that. And um, again, we in our paper, we really dig deep into different types of job characteristics and different pathways. Um, we know that stress is not good for the brain. When we're experiencing stress or challenging emotional situations, um, it takes away from our attentional capacity. Um, and we're spending our brain, whether we're aware of it or not, is spending um, resources to focus on regulating our emotions and focusing our attention in a way that may not be good for our cognitive functioning. 
Um, and for those of you that may have a background in, in human factors and understanding kind of the importance of designing things in a way to make it easier on our brains to process information, um, hopefully that makes sense to you. So again, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't expect in this time that you're gonna see all the details, but, but that's the gist. Um, so what does this mean? So hopefully I've um, presented some convincing empirical evidence that designing work in a way that is motivating and creates positive emotional states for workers is good for well-being um, in the short term, good for intrinsic motivation and hopefully enjoying the work that we do. Um, longer term, helping us maintain positive well-being in terms of mental and physical health. Um, the most recent, uh, the study looking at job complexity over time, showing that by engaging in cognitively complex work is hopefully beneficial for our cognitive functioning at work. And of course, to the extent that our, our brain and our bodies are connected, that's helpful. Um, so what we want to do is be mindful of the characteristics of the work that we're doing. Um, much like Dr. Allen and many of you designed a beautiful building to facilitate the work and the interactions among people here in the center. Um, also being mindful of, of not just how you design a physical workspace, but how you might design um, the tasks that people do. Or, or if you say, okay, our job is to accomplish this project. What are ways to go about designing that where you can provide autonomy, where you can provide skill variety, uh, social support, um, and do things in a way and then have policies in the work environment that support workers' health. And so knowing that, you know, to the extent that um, from the, the first paper I shared, where health status is beneficial for workability, whatever can be done to help people maintain their physical and mental health um, so that they can continue working, again, being beneficial, leading up to retirement, but hopefully helping people after retirement. Um, so I, I didn't anticipate I would have time for um, this last study. So I'll just uh, flip through and, and say again, I'll be glad to share the, the full paper on that. Um, but the, the gist of that is that we need to also match the person and the job. Um, we can't just take any random person and put them in a job and expect them to be successful and expect it to be beneficial for their well-being. But looking at the characteristics of the people and the characteristics of those job and mapping it, um, and we see uh, through concordance that that's beneficial. So um, again, being mindful of job design, having good fit between people and jobs, um, and all of this has important implications for when people retire, as well as their health and well-being in later life. And so what can we do? We can develop and evaluate interventions to foster an age-friendly workforce, meaning regardless of people's age, what can we do to design work in a way that's going to be beneficial? Um, also, more interventions to figure out how people can manage tasks, particularly if they're experiencing health or cognitive challenges. Um, and then what can we do to look further at work stress and the role of work stress in this process? Um, one of the things on this cognitive side that I'm interested in is let's say that we have somebody who's declining um, and we want to see is it better to reduce the amount that they're responsible for or the length of time they're doing it and keep them there or should they leave that workplace and go find a different more simple job um and and i don't know that we fully know the answer to that question but that's something i'm, I'm curious about um so a lot of people to thank and acknowledge um in the work that I've done, uh, none of what I've shared would be here if it weren't for the tremendous help and support from um, a whole bunch of colleagues. And just um, because I'm, I've talked longer than I wanted, I'll just stop there and, and open it up for questions and discussion. I've got a comment from Sylvia online. Sure. She asks, is task identity potentially stressful if you have too many different responsibilities like you're expected to be a jack of all trades? Yes. Um, that's a, the short answer is yes. And so what we can get is what's called role overload, where in any one job, you just have too many things that you need to do. Um, and also uh, it can create ambiguity in how to prioritize tasks 
and figure out what to do. And, and it can certainly be stressful. So, and, and the same goes, I think, for autonomy. You know, we often think about, um, well, we see a lot of research that shows that people like autonomy, but there may be a point where too much autonomy is a bad thing. Um, those of us in faculty roles, I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's pretty autonomous. And there isn't really a supervisor to tell you exactly what to do and how to do it even when you want that. Um, and so I, I think, you know, exactly, uh, you know, is it a curvilinear relationship and, and where is that break point? Um, I think there's certainly a need for, for future work to look at that, but good question. Thank you for a lovely talk. Um, uh, when we get down to the workers, um, the variety of tasks, even, even within one job category or title or class is so enormous. And uh, I, I don't dispute the, the average, but you know, I, I go back to you know, mother and all of the assembly line work she did not want to do anything but that. She loved uh, socializing all day long because she could take chit chat the whole day uh, up and down. And it's just the opposite of the data. And we can go that way with people who are building roads and bridges and all that sort of stuff. There's very little autonomy. They have to do what they want to do. And a bunch of them really love what they're doing. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, struck by a boat. <laughs> it's really, a, uh, it's important to know the generalities, but I, when we deal with the complexities of human, I, I'm just trying to elicit your thoughts about the uh, Absolutely, that's a really important point. And I think what you're referring to is um, really capturized, cap, uh, captured well on the second bullet point. Um, and I did not really share data on this today is above all else, recognizing the importance and the benefit of person job fit. So what I'm describing again is, and thank you for pointing it out, it's on the whole and it's generalizing and it's often easy for us to think about high level professional cognitively complex jobs, but there are many, many people that don't want a more complex job. I'm not gonna lie, there are days I drive by Trader Joe's and I think, gosh, can I just go stock shelves? Um, or, or just have a very simple job and not have to go home to grade papers, answer emails, write grants, and, you know, and, and help support graduate students who find this thing stressful. Um, and so, so in short, I, we have to, you're absolutely right, we need to take individual differences into account. And, and what I described is not going to work if it's not a good fit for those people. Um, the other thing, though, is that when people are in jobs, it's beneficial when they can focus on what they like and what's beneficial. And so what we don't know is, um, and please understand, I don't wanna say anything offensive, but there may be somebody who's in a um, job, say for example, working on an assembly line and they got that job because they didn't have the education or the opportunity to move somewhere else to get a job to do something else. And often, and also those jobs can pay well. And so it's focusing on what they like um, and it's possible that some of those people, given different exposure and experiences, may have had different experiences. So the fact that somebody's in that work and they love it and they wouldn't want to do something else, that's great. Because um, we don't know what would have happened if we had, quote, randomly assigned them to go do something else. But, but the bottom line is person job fit is, is really important. And there's a lot of research uh, that has been done in psychology that has really emphasized that. I don't know, Dr. Allen, would you agree with my conclusion that person job fit, like there's a lot of support for that? Yeah, there, there is. Uh, we talk about that uh, in our intro to OHP um, class because of what you described, um, Dr. Hegman, that, you know, a person, people are so different, right? Uh, and there are plenty of people who like uh, one, you know, a certain type of work that another person would find um, unenjoyable and be very unhappy with. In fact, my, my thesis actually looked into that. I looked at um, customer service orientation which is a compound personality characteristic. And we find there are people that, and you've probably met some of these people who really love working in a restaurant and, and serving in many tables or, or really like working in retail, you know, folding clothes or whatever, and, and then serving the customers. And that's because they, they fit 
with that job. And, and that's that fits their personality, if it's their their interests and their and, and what they like to do. And so that that aspect of it can't be overlooked when thinking about these these findings, even though we have we do, there are these general trends. If you, you can always identify exceptions or ex extreme values and things uh, in the data that would go against what would be considered the normal or the or the me the mean um, of of the of the findings. So, yeah, completely agree. There was one study done. Thank you. There was one study that was done in Germany in an auto manufacturing facility where over a period of time. Um, some workers were given a little bit more task variety and others weren't. And then they looked at cognition down the road and they found that those that were given um, more of a variety of different tasks over time ended up performing better cognitively than the others. So that's the closest I've seen to some like experimental work, if you will, of being able to see what happens when you manipulate or vary these job characteristics. So even within, say, an assembly line or, or manufacturing environment, you know, a little bit more autonomy or a little bit more um, task variety or skill variety may be beneficial um, in some measurable ways or impactful ways um, without, you know, saying, okay, we have to take this person and move them to a totally different job. So I see that we're, we're past time. So I, I want to respect everybody's time, um, but I'm also happy to answer other questions and, and share more resources and just more than anything, appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you and thanks for your time.